Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome. Um, I'm just making sure that my audio works. One second. Give me a second, folks. I'm having a tiny bit of a technical difficulty here. Okay. Can you all hear me? Mitch, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this program is part of an APA series called Essential Science Conversation, where panelists and audience members can engage in an open dialogue uh, about emerging topics in psychological science. Uh, today's conversation will focus on the ongoing debates and biases regarding quantitative versus qualitative research methods. Um, this topic often elicits strong opinions within the scientific community. Uh, today's panelists are well versed in this topic and I really look forward to hearing what they have to say. But before we get started, I just need to go over a few housekeeping details. First, thank you to all of you who submitted questions for today's program when you registered. We're going to try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, you also can ask a question as the program is taking place in real time. Uh, there's a panel that's labeled questions in your webinar dashboard. Just click on that panel and type your question into the box. And I'll be monitoring those questions throughout the program. Um, secondly, this program is being recorded, so once it ends, everyone who registered will receive an email link to the recording, and you should receive that email a few hours after the webinar ends. That email is also going to contain a certificate of participation, just in case you need something like that as well. And finally, I have to plug our web page, the Essential Science Conversation web page, where you can find recordings, slides, and written transcripts of all our programs. Be sure to bookmark the link, check in often, and there is the link on the slide, but I'm also going to share that in the chat box in just a second. But before I do that, oops, I'm sorry. I would like to introduce our host, who will be leading today's conversation. Let's welcome Dr. Mitch Prinstein, who is APA's Chief Science Officer. Welcome, Mitch. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to you, and you can take over. Great. Thank you, Peggy, so much for your help with this. Um, always so helpful and terrific. Wes Baker, too. And thank you so much for everyone for attending. I'm really excited about today's conversation. I'm also really excited about the terrific panel that we have. I'd like to introduce them. Our first panelist is Dr. Elizabeth Creamer. Elizabeth is Professor Emerita from the Educational Research and Evaluation Program in the School of Education at Virginia Tech. She served on the board of the Mixed Methods International Research Association for four years, including in the role of president. Her latest writing project involves a new textbook called Leveraging Visual Displays During Analysis in Mixed Methods Research. I'm also really excited that today we have joining us Dr. Joseph Gahn. Joseph is a professor of anthropology and global health and social medicine at Harvard University. He is an international expert in the psychology and mental health of American Indians and other indigenous peoples. He's collaborated with tribal communities for over 25 years to critique conventional mental health services, harness traditional culture and spirituality for advancing indigenous well-being. And our third panelist today is Dr. Eric Youngstrom. Eric is a professor um, and of uh, psychology and also psychology and neuroscience and psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he's also the acting director for the Center of Excellence in Research and Treatment of Bipolar Disorder. He's the co-founder and executive director of Helping Give Away Psychological Science which is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to dis uh, disseminating free information about psychological science. Wow, what an amazing panel. Thank you all so much for being here. I am really excited and I'm excited for us to have an essential science conversation. Um, this is an interesting topic because this is a topic that many people have very strong feelings about. Some people have really been you know, uh, brought up, as it were, in the, their science training to think that quantitative 
or that qualitative research might be kind of a preferred method or a kind of the way in which we're supposed to be doing science. And um, there are even ways in which that has affected what journal articles are published, uh, in what outlets, what's considered, you know, rigorous science. And all of this is really in the midst of change because for a variety of reasons. One reason is because um, sure. we are beginning to talk more and more about the way that our science has really reflected a dominant viewpoint that has really been um, reflecting those with privilege and those um, who have been really leading the science conversations for a long time. Joe, I wanted to start with you. You know, what are the ways in which we might want to start thinking differently about qualitative versus quantitative research now that we're trying to work so hard towards equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice in our research? Well, thanks, Mitch, and it's really great to join you all here today. Um, I appreciate that question a lot because, as you know, I'm the co-chair of the APA Task Force on Strategies to Eradicate Racism, Discrimination, and Hate, and so we're thinking a lot about the APA Apology for Racism and the commitment to, to uh, do different uh, going forward in the future. Um, my work, as you mentioned, is about indigenous community mental health, and I've been doing that work for 25 years, and there's a lot of ways in which I think uh, opposition of quantitative and qualitative approaches to research is not helpful at all in that space or domain. Um, I think that's uh, not helpful for several reasons. One reason is because um, the kinds of questions you ask really should be driving the kinds of methods that you adopt. And it seems silly to me um, in a practical and pragmatic frame of mind about knowledge production to sort of, if you will, metaphorically say, well, we only use saws around here, no hammers allowed, sorry, we're building a house, but we're not allowing hammers. In my mind, these are tools. Tools are adopted to accomplish particular objectives. And so it gets back to these big questions you have to ask. In indigenous mental health, which is understudied and has been understudied for a very long time, particularly in terms of lots of questions that we might have um, in which indigenous people with specific histories and cultural diversity and so on might have um, and require um, you know, inquiry um, beyond what is typically done in the mainstream. Um, we don't know a lot of answers to questions. So a lot of that work, work is in its early phases. A lot of early scientific work requires more uh, observational and descriptive approaches, which often fall to qualitative inquiry. So the kinds of questions we ask at this point may require more of that. Um, maybe we can get to RCTs and mental health interventions at some point, which of course are great tools for trying to unpack cause and effect relationships and treatments and outcomes. The final thing I'll say is in work with indigenous communities, there is increasingly an interest in among community members themselves in calling researchers to accountability for the work that we do and in um, trying to harness indigenous approaches, knowledges, and even methodologies um, in the work that we do. And so there's often a stated, objective, explicit commitment from community partners who say, we want storytelling, we want narrative methods and analysis, and so on. And so when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, um, I, I think hearkening to our community partners is really important. If they say they want qualitative inquiry, that's even another reason to want to make room for that in psychology. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's incredibly helpful. Elizabeth, I, I have heard people say that if you adopt a quantitative or qualitative methodological approach, you, are all, you have already accepted epistemological assumptions and uh, a framework that is guiding your approach. And most people don't are not aware of that. Most people feel like, well, this is the way you're supposed to be doing research. There is no assumption that I've already adopted um, in, in choosing a quantitative approach or qualitative approach. Um, but actually, there's a lot of work on theoretical psychology, on, um, on uh, humanistic psychology that speaks to that in different ways. Can you speak at all to the kind of different approaches and assumptions that we make when we adopt a qualitative versus a, a quantitative perspective? Sure. Um... The question really is a, a pervasive and long-standing one. Um, it was raised in the 80s and the 70s when it was talked about the paradigm wars where qualitative was beginning to gain a foothold and mixed methods behind it. It is a long and um, pervasive argument, the idea that qual and quant are two ep different epistemologies. And I think that is a mistaken assumption because a method 
doesn't really have an epistemology independent uh, the tied to the tool. So if you pick up Joe's um, metaphor, a hammer is a hammer. Uh, a saw is a saw. It doesn't have assumptions about reality embedded in the hammer. And it doesn't have assumptions and embedded in reality in the saw. So the person, the people that bring those assumptions are, are part of a social, uh, social philosophical movement um, that is both individual and social. So let me just say just a, let me take that just a little bit further. So I, a, a positivist uh, coming out of the post-war years where there's a truth, an objective truth and a reality really struggles with um, qualitative traditions. But as soon as you move over one notch on the timeline, for instance, you move into constructivism, a constructive, I consider myself a constructivist, a social constructivist. What does that mean? It means you believe reality is constructed, that there's not really, an, a, there may be a reality out there, but we all perceive it in very unique ways. So when I approach research, whether I'm, some days I'm a pragmatist, some days I'm a constructivist, in grounded theory, Kathy Sharman was a constructivist. I see all research, qualitative and quantitative, as having a subjective element. Um, we make decisions and choices as we um, move through our research methods. So mixed methods researchers can see them as opposing paradigms, and the, some of the designs allow. Um, the qual and quant tracks to run parallel but independent, so they never really talk to each other. Um, but the constructivist approach is like you wear one hat, and I try to re I try to be as skeptical about numbers as I am about text. So hopefully that gets to some of the issues because it's a it's a very uh, big question. This Thank you so much for that. That was really helpful. Yeah, Eric, what do you see as the pros and cons? I, the first time that I've heard both both of you speak, and I'm so excited about the perspectives and 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 what. So both both of you know a lot more about the application of of qualitative methods than than I do. I've been a co-investigator. I've been I've been a sidekick, but I haven't been the the person. Um. But but both both are talking about thinking about what's the question and what's the best tool for the question, and and also thinking about sort of the pragmatism, the the concrete example. Uh, my wife had me hanging pictures, and I didn't bring a hammer um, up onto the ladder. And I'm looking around. I'm like, do I need to to start over? And I I had a uh, uh, tape measure and I'm like I think I could and I bap 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 and that was not the best tool for that if I'd known what I was getting into when I went up the ladder I would have I would have picked a different toolkit um but I was able to to get that done and then like in the, I'm not, obviously not writing a paper about hanging pictures but I'm like in future directions um next time that you're you're approaching this sort of problem you might want to use a, a different approach um thinking about thinking about i'm trained as a clinical psychologist and i look at things quantitative measures that everybody's using like the phq9 and i'm like where did the number nine come from why are those the magic nine symptoms that decide whether someone has depression or not? And, and you look at the field and we're like, you know, if we had it to do over again, there are a lot of important things that may have gotten left out. And then you talk to people from other countries, other languages, and you're like, OMG, why aren't we starting over again? Why, why aren't we having qualitative methodologists really unpacking? What is the lived experience of, of depression for you? How is that different than the lived experience of being 
in social isolation during quarantine? The, like there's so many rich questions once you start um, thinking about the what would be the best way of, of approaching it. That's helpful, thank you. You know, I can imagine people listening and saying, all right, so I don't get it. If you want to study depression in a, let's say, a native tribe or community that's rarely been studied, you go to the literature, you read about the symptoms, you know, uh, feeling disconnected, um, feeling uh, a foreshortened sense of future, and just develop a questionnaire and just go give it out and then you can have quantitative data and then you can use that quantitative data. What would be the problem with that, Joe? Why, why can't we just do quantitative data to learn about new cultures or um, why do we have to switch to qualitative? Well, um, so you, you might recall, of course, um, the differentiation that cross-cultural psychologists have made based on anthropology and linguistics, actually, between etic and emic approaches to research. Etic, of course, is to take an external, top-down driven uh, template and apply it wherever you go. Emic means tr trying to investigate and inquire in open-ended fashion from the ground up. And the problem with a construct like depression is that we don't really know to what degree it exists as an entity in nature that would apply across all of human experience, both across time and across place. And so um, because we don't really know what depression is, psychiatrists and psychologists will tell you uh, right now we do phenomenological symptoms to try to uh, identify what a disorder is, as opposed to, you know, um, construct validity that would be gauged by uh, causal sorts of things and treatment responses and so on. In this instance, um, we don't know what depression is and how it varies. And so um, what you might want to do if you're working with people from around the world is to try to investigate, well, what does you know something that looks casually like depression really translate into? In various native communities, the very best psychiatric epidemiology has revealed low rates of so-called internalizing disorders and higher rates of externalizing disorders. So there is an epidemiological discrepancy, uh, whereas depression is often seen to be one of the most prevalent disorders in mainstream America, for example, that doesn't appear to be true in indigenous communities. So the question then becomes, is it a measurement problem? Like we're not picking up the right ways to inquire mm -hmm. about that? Or is the uh, actual experience and expression of distress different because of cultural reasons? And I can suggest to you some cultural reasons which have to do with you know, interdependence that then leads to less of a focus on one's inward looking kinds of symptoms and more distress that is between people, for example, that might be one way to look. So all of that requires a different approach that doesn't presume so much, which is why an etic approach that simply takes depression screeners or DSM criteria and goes into an indigenous community and simply ticks off, yep, they have it, no, they don't, and then reports the numbers might not actually be illuminating. It might result in what my colleague here at Harvard, Arthur Kleinman, called a category fallacy that's, that maybe depression doesn't exist in the way we form formulated in the professions in some of these communities. And even Thank if you. it even if it did, the the etic approach, the like if there were some things that were consistent across across human experience everywhere, it would get that part right. Where where it's hopelessly lost is figuring out what else, what are the what are the edges, what are the other, what are the other contexts and um, so so it's not 100% wrong it's just like occasionally you get a bullseye and the rest of the time help so how do you know that the information you're getting from qualitative research is appropriately representative or that the conclusions that you get are are not merely due to chance what what do we do with kind of the quantitative training that we've had and how do we reconcile those things we've been taught when we think about a qualitative approach. You, if I'll jump in here, this, um, you really are using a different purpose with a qualitative approach than representativeness. So of course you could use a representative sample with qualitative research, but the idea of generalizability is not something inherent in qualitative research. What you're interested in qualitative research, particularly when you put it together with quantitative, is depth and breadth. So you're trying to expand your understanding to develop a more holistic, multi-layered sort of image. 
And, and so it's really, that is a play, the issue of sampling, the logic is quite different. So you're going for um, more breadth um, to understand a phenomenon. That's helpful. So ideally, it sounds like there would be some crosstalk between the qualitative research and the quantitative research. My experience so far has been that these are published in different places and they're different researchers mm -hmm. talking in different subgroups. What do we need to do to kind of create more crosstalk? Joe, I'd be curious what your experiences or thoughts are about about creating outlets and opportunities for that crosstalk. And also, Elizabeth, I'd be curious to hear more about mixed methods approaches. Joe, uh, any thoughts about kind of the outlets? Yeah, um, so, I, you know, I think it depends a bit on like the sociology of, of psychology as a field. A, a lot of um, gains have been made over the time that I've been a psychologist, I graduated in 2001, uh, with larger acceptance and familiarity with qualitative inquiry. You know, one of the biggest um, contributions, I think, was the development of Division uh, Fives, uh, the Society for Qualitative Inquiry in Psychology, which is a section of Division Five, Quantitative and Qualitative Methods. Um, those folks labored for a very long time to get that division in place, and then now it's, you know, representing and carrying the flag for qualitative inquiry in a way that uh, expresses and resonates with my career. Uh, my career for the past 20 years has been heavily marked by qualitative inquiry. Again, not because I favor it necessarily, but because that's where the state of the research is in the uh, research that I do. Um, and uh, I don't think it would have been possible even 10 years before for someone who did primarily qualitative inquiry to be able to make it through tenure and so on in the way that I did. So things are on the move in a way that I think is good. And I they think are, that yeah. having people become more familiar and more engaged with it is one way to help. I do think that, um, you know, journal editorial policies that like blanketly prescribe qualitative inquiry are really short-sighted and harmful in this respect. I encountered one of those recently in an APA flagship journal. Um, and the problem with it is that it's a very narrow view of science that presumes that um, we know we can make clear distinctions between what's scientific and what's not scientific and what's pre-scientific. And actually any philosopher of science that you consult over the past 60, 70 years who've questioned the logical empiricists, what they were doing in the 30s and the way Elizabeth talked about, you know, um, we don't really have clear boundaries between what's scientific and what's not scientific. And if you look at the range of sciences, astronomy, paleontology, you know, the methods that they employ are really suited and fitted to the kind of inquiry they're engaged in. So I think it's not a hard thing to grasp for people to recognize that questions should determine methods and not vice versa. And also to point out that we do have a kind of methodological parochialism in our discipline. There is a hegemony of certain forms of uh, variable analytic analysis that comes with our training. But if you start to push people a little bit on that, they usually haven't thought through it enough to be able to adequately defend it. And they can become more open-minded with some conversation. The more you go into philosophy of science or you know, um, silos about you have to embrace this particular approach to even do this work. You know, I don't think that's helpful in this respect. Um, so I do think that, you know, we talk about method, which is embedded in methodology, which is really the logic or rationale for inquiry. Epistemology is kind of way high order, and I don't go there very often because I actually think all of university-based inquiry, whether it's scientific or hum humanistic, has shared epistemology around, you know, it's rational, you have to have peers critique it, um, and it's refined in that way. I think even if it's science or not science, that's shared. And that may be the kind of epistemological stuff that I don't think is helpful when you're talking qualitative and quantitative. I agree completely. I was thinking, getting ready for this, when was the last time I cited Kant in a paper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Things change. I think part of the issue you asked, Mitch, about training well, you asked about, um, I got, well, let's just go to the training point. I think the real trick in training is to get over this binary logic that somewhere early in our careers, we need to declare, raise the flag, I'm quant, I'm qual, as if you get to just use one method as you go out in the world, get engaged in these large real world projects. You start doing funded research, you start doing research in the field. Um, 
you start trying to communicate with different audiences. So when you get in the business of wanting to communicate with stakeholders, they're not really interested in your fancy statistics and your regression. They're much more interested in the stories. So I think the idea, the whole training idea that we have qual courses and then a few quant courses and heaven forbid we should have a mixed methods course. But I think people nowadays in facing the complexity that we are facing, these worldwide problems, you cannot afford to say, well, this is my area of specialty and this is what I study because that's not where the funding is. That's not where the future is. So I think you really have to see yourself as being competent in qualitative and quantitative. I'm not saying an expert, I'm saying competent. So you don't overly trust that the qual person knows what you're doing, but you don't overly trust the quant person knows what they're doing either. So I think we really have to move away from this binary idea that qualitative and quantitative are so different. There are, most people characterize they have more in common than they differ. And, and Joe touched on some of those, you know, we share many academic values about empirical research, He's totally right. When you survey faculty, they don't spend much time thinking about epistemology. Um, they're just trying to get their research done. Are qualitative or mixed methods approaches taught in the psychology departments where you are all at? Not mixed methods. Harvard, UNC? They're they're available at Carolina, but <clears throat> but not not taught under the roof of Davy Hall all the time. You would have to go to Odom Institute or the School of Nursing. Um, so they're they're there if you know where where to look or how to to find them. Should it be part of training that happens under the roof of a psychology department? I um I really love what Elizabeth said about about being conversant and familiar with the methods and and so thinking about the framework of do you have exposure do you have um, competence do you have expertise in this I think I think that it, at a minimum having exposure would would be a great thing um, I appreciated Joseph's shout out to Heidi Levitt and Linda and, and the the group that got the and so, so SQIP, the Society for, for Qualitative, the, that's part of Division Five, and a very vibrant, very active part of it. Um, so I think that them having, and kudos to APA for publishing the, the guidelines. So right up next to the JARS and the MARS criteria for, for meta-analysis, there, there are the guidelines for qualitative, um, and so, mixed methods. The most recent edition includes mixed method. The the mixed methods thing, I I have a, a very practical, pragmatic reaction of um, it's hard. The if you if you send it to a journal, so so part of the peer review process is they send it out to multiple people, and there are memes on the internet about getting reviewer three. And and uh, and so the the chance of of getting two being like this looks this looks like good science and then reviewer three is coming at, and hating on the if you if you show qualitative methods and you get a quantitative dyed in the wool reviewer three that's a problem and if you get a and so so the how do you how do you navigate reviewer three is a very very practical issue. Um, every time that I have been a part of it, I've been part of a team and, and I'm, I'm counting on other people to have expertise. Um, but I also think that, that the, it's important for the field to hear that this is important. So thank you for organizing this podcast. Um, and, and for editors to be like, hey, hey. I heard on this webinar that, that the reviewers might have strong opinions and be split, and that doesn't mean it's bad science. We, mm -hmm. need, we need editors to feel empowered, to be like, you know, um, the, 
it's it's okay that we have some 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 tension or disagreement about this. The um, all those things I think are practical issues and and ways that we could speed the change. And let me give a specific suggestion here on this topic. Most journals, and I checked this recently because I'm co-editor of the Methods in Psychology, but if you go to the AIM statements of the APA journals, they are usually quite clear on the priority, whether it's quantitative, quantitative, or qualitative, quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods. They, are us they usually spell it out. So one of the ways to choose the journals to publish in is check, be sure to check that AIM statement. Um, if it doesn't mention mixed methods, you might want to find a journal, for instance, that mentions mixed methods. If it only mentions quantitative, I, I think I would save my qual publication for another venue. Um, so that's one way to, to uh, get some sense where there's an openness to it. And there's one other thing I want to just put on the table because I think it helps to explain to people why there is differentiation between quant and qual in this way that endures in ways that I think it sounds like our panelists are agreeing are kind of problematic. I mean, it starts with the logical empiricists or the logical positivists from the 30s who were trying to access reality somewhat directly in their research. And I think we've all abandoned, they abandoned that within years of even positing it. We recognize now we don't have unvarnished perception of reality. All statements about reality are representational and therefore actually have quote bias unquote or perspective or positionality as part of them. So really the question then becomes how is it that scientists should manage and account for their positionality? And I think variable analytic and interpretive research do this differently. Variable analytic research or we could say quantitative research if to be more familiar really offloads a lot onto the procedures by which um, knowledge is created. You know, if you conduct proper, vari uh, if you, ass if you um, assess for proper variables um, and you apply these statistical procedures to them, for assuming the assumptions hold and you get interpretable outcomes, we all have, co we have decided by consensus that we know what that means. And so it offloads the concern about perspective and bias into the kind of procedures themselves, that we agree that there's certain ways that you can interpret and then we go on to say things about it. I think interpretive, or if you want to say uh, qualitative inquiry, is much more trying to get at meaning making, human meaning making in much more rich and in-depth ways. And so if you're trying, the, the best way humans make sense of other people's understandings is to interpret them. And so interpretations, of course, are part and parcel of one's position and one's perspective. Um, and so you need to like be able to offer an account that is compelling and plausible to critics as to why you've arrived at that interpretation from these uh, interviews or focus groups or whatever you're doing. Um, and, and there are criteria that people have come up with to try to help ensure that. But it's a different kind of endeavor that is aimed at different kinds of knowledge production. And there are even forms of qualitative inquiry, not so much in psychology, where the goal is almost Almost like literary like if you're like take personality personality research psychobiography where those folks have been interested sometimes in offering the most compelling interpretation of a life that is possible now what makes a compelling interpretation might not be replicable maybe you want the you want four and five brilliant people taking a reading of quote the meaning of Hitler I'm watching a documentary lately you know where they're not going to agree at all they're going but they might have brilliant takes that are really insightful and they're not replicable by design because you've got brilliant interpretations going on now that's not what psychology often does so much in the mainstream but at lower levels focus groups and so on there are criteria that help to guide whether an interpretation should be accepted as compelling or not well it's, if I just want I add one thing to that and I know you need to move on but I think the relative, the, the relic of positivism exists in mixed methods too. So Joe is talking about this idea that you do a procedure and because you do the procedure systematically, that means quality. In mixed methods, the assumption historically, though it's shifting, has been if you pick one of the designs, one of the conventional designs, that therefore you have established the quality of your research, which I think is a relic of, post, of positivism and is totally shallow. <laughs> so I'm, I'm struck by in all of, our, all of our answers, we talk about the importance of story and narrative 
<clears throat> and there's a, a book by Randy Olson. Houston, we have a narrative, Why Science Needs Story, which is highly recommended by the National Science Foundation. Um, Andy Delos Reyes is the, the person that, that put me, put it under my nose. But, but like even the National Science Foundation agrees, science needs story. Um, the, the, the interesting thing, I don't know if we're allowed to ask each other questions, but I'm gonna. The um, psychology has, has, we're coming out of a reproducibility crisis and, and, and we've looked at our 100 greatest hits and, and tried to, to replicate them. And the failure to replicate has been, been interpreted as a major issue for, for psychology as a, a scientific field. So I'm, I'm really curious, like everything else I've been nodding and I'm like, yes, I love this. And oh, I'm so relieved to hear this. And the, but, the, but I'm curious about, does reproducibility have a different role um, epistemically, or is that is that not something that we should be considering? I mean, my thoughts on that are, uh, it depends again on what you're interested in and what your goal is. So um, I think that there are whole domains of psychology in which uh, the replicability results matters a lot because the claims are about things like patterns, almost laws of mind and behavior. We usually don't have laws anymore. Patterns of mind and behavior that we want to postulate are universal. They're part of how humans are made up. You know, and for that kind of work, if that's what you're interested in furthering or advancing, the replicability matters a lot. One problem I'd say though, um, with that approach, just to, just to reinforce why offloading into the procedural in a consensus-based way what the meaning of results is, is that it very uh, strictly limits um, the kinds of questions you can ask. You know, if we're basically saying we only use mm -hmm. saws here, then you have to be able to, you have to be wanting to cut wood. <laughs> and, 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 and there are lots of questions that are psychological questions in which, um, you know, applying a saw wouldn't be the most interesting thing to do. So uh, there are different domains and there have been from the beginning. Usually if we take history and systems as clinical programs have been required to do for APA accreditation for a long time, um, you, you know, you, you learn a story of psychology that's about its scientific aspirations and endeavors. Um, but, you know, Wundt himself had two kinds of psychology, including a Folker psychology, which is what we might loosely translate as a cultural psychology day, which is a more human sciences approach rather than a natural or positivist approach uh, mm -hmm. to psychology. So there are these interesting trends and fashions, and they persist today, even though some are more hegemonic than others. Um, but replication matters for certain endeavors, and I think not so much for others. For someone like me, who probably takes more of a human sciences approach, which is to say that the interesting aspects of psychology to me are not universal, are not stable, um, that there are those things, but I think that that's at low level stuff like brain function and things like that. The things that I care about are meaning making, um, you know, personality, emotions, things that are constituted by the meanings we make. And therefore, I think a human science approach to that, which is not necessarily replicable or universal, can be very illuminating, uh, at least not replicable across all of psychology. I would contest, for example, that there are six basic emotions. You know, I would think that actually in the communities I work with, social emotions are a lot more salient because people would socialize in interdependent kinds of life. So jealousy, a resentment, love, um, you know, uh, uh, pity or compassion. These are the emotions that are important um, to people in Indian families and communities, you know, not the abstract, detached, individualist kinds of emotions. I'll stop there. Well, I'll take you just a raise, little, please. I was Go going ahead. to just take a medium ground in between the two positions about repli replication. I think there's a value, and I want to say that crosses methods in methodological transparency and providing enough information about your research methods that your viewer or reader can make a judgment if the conclusions are something they can, they can, that they find credible. So the emphasis on methodological transparency, which is in the guidelines, you'll see it in the APA guidelines, it's, it's really about being transparent about your research methods. That's not the same as replication. I'm not saying it's replication, but I'm saying that the, it leaves the breadcrumb trail about your research methods so people can decide if your conclusions are really empirical. 
I love it's that. Very point. helpful. Yeah, Eric, I, I wanted to follow up on that and just kind of ask, you know, the the thought about replicability, the talk about transparency and methods, in in many ways, circles uh, an issue that I know most psychological scientists feel, and that is respect for the rigor of psychological science. And one of the questions that we got so often um, when when people signed up for this webinar today was, why is qualitative research considered re less rigorous? Or another way of, uh, a different way of asking that similar question would be, is there a difference between highly rigorous qualitative research and less rigorous qualitative research? So we can we can still uphold of our course. desire to be a rigorous science. What would you say to that? Yup. <laughs> yeah. First, what first does that look like? Yeah. You know, one first one thing I have. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Elizabeth. I was going to say, of course, there's a difference between there. It, there's good qualitative research. There's rigorous qualitative research. That they don't like that word. Um, and there's not so good. And one of the big um, sticking points in terms of credibility is sample size. Um, the issue, of, um, and even the word sampling isn't appropriate here, but the number of participants and how homogeneous the participants are, that's been a big problem with a big, big critique of, of grounded theory, the use of grounded theory of qualitative tradition. So there are issues of rigor, even though those that, that's not language that qualitative people use. Joe, you were going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, again, from a certain perspective within psychology, um, you know, some of the replicability uh, crisis is not only not so concerning, it's expected. <laughs> I mean, that the idea, for example, from a human scientist perspective, that human psychology, human behavior are modes of life that are diverse across different cultural communities and over time. That actually our modes of life are always on the move, they're always evolving, and that psychology therefore, research will produce findings that are historically contingent. They're tied to modes of life in times and places and don't necessarily generalize. And so in that sense, if you imagine that you know psychology has mainly been undertaken with Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic societies and the way we've all been taught of recent years, um, then you know the work that has been done is on a very small swath of humanity. And the fact that those findings are starting to come apart in, in the wake of maybe further inclusion or just over time is not surprising from that vantage point. So in terms of replicability, the one last thing I wanna add here is rigor is important. And I think that all the work that psychological scientists do needs to be rigorous. But what counts as rigor is tied in part to the methodological endeavor that you're engaged in. And so there would, might be very different criteria. And rigor is no guarantee okay. that psychological scientists will accept the findings. And the proof of this historically, and even pretty concurrently, is parapsychology. When I was a grad stu student, Psych Bulletin had an article by Bem and Onerton that reviewed the Otto Gansfeld experimental procedures on PSI or ESP. And they had 20 studies or whatever, I think it was actually 11, 11 studies that showed that ESP exists. Do psychological scientists think that ESP exists? No. Could you poke a hole in the methodology and the rigor to show that they were wrong? No. You can't, and just like Daryl Bam published in JPSP not a decade ago now about, you know, psi, right? So parapsychology is an illuminating lesson because it reminds us that the knowledge we want to undertake is actually very, very difficult. It's almost, you know, you don't want to become nihilist about knowledge, but it's very hard to know stuff. And science is, you know, probably the best tool we have for certain kinds of questions, but even then it's very limited. <laughs> parapsychology teaches us that. Mm -hmm. Eric, any thoughts about that? Elizabeth, I'm sorry, to Elizabeth talking about looking at the methods and, and figuring out are they credible, um, I realize that I'm a little lost at how to evaluate whether they're credible. What I, I'm sort of, I'm, I've read many, many, many methods papers for quantitative papers. And if I'm just reading, I'm, I smile and nod. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. But when I actually sit down and try to replicate it or apply the method, I'm like, this is actually a black box. It's a good looking black box, but th this was in yeah. no way adequate for me to evaluate the, the quantitative methods. So I'd, I'd be curious if you have any any pro tips about like what what are what are signals of quality or good or or markers of 
transparent, uh, like transparency, how, if you know what you're looking at or what you're looking for, what does it look like? Let me, let me just hit a couple. Um, I'll make it, I'm going to make it sound simple, but it's not. I think in this case that um, the use of figures and tables that link that that link findings or results or conclusions which are different um, to the data sources and that or and or and the literature are critical to building that argument and i also think it's extremely helpful to adopt the uh, a mindset that you're talking to a very suspicious audience, you know, in general, all researchers, you know, the, we have skeptical audiences, right? They wanna challenge our research methods, regardless what our research methods are, right? They wanna, if you go to a conference, what they pick apart is the research methods, not, you know, you, you may have discovered the, can, the cure for cancer, or, you know, you think you have, but what they're gonna argue about is your, is your research methods, right? So in mixed methods, it's extremely important to trace, to document to your viewer that these are the conclusions that came from qual, these are the conclusions that came from quant, and, and lo and behold, when I put them together, here's some another layer of information that came out. So tracing the evidence to the source of data, I'm giving you just one way that I think is critical to quality. I would add one other thing, which is to say that it's very difficult across qualitative inquiry. I mean, there's so many different forms. It's like saying that there's some way to evaluate this across yeah. quantitative. There's no way to do it. So the work and, and Heidi Levitt and colleagues, you know, the, the, the American Psych guidelines, which are helpful, right? Those are, thank God someone did that, but it's very hard to amass across all forms of inquiry. One inquiry I use a lot is thematic analysis. And my go-to article is by Brown and Clark from 2006, how to conduct thematic analysis in psychology. They have six phases that you follow. They have uh, 15 criteria for whether it's a good thematic analysis. In addition, because I often publish in health journals, I default to the COREC criteria by Tong et al. And I'm not gonna remember what COREC stands for, C-O-R-E-Q. But it's 52, it's a 52 item checklist that if you're doing interviews and focus groups in health sciences, and it's you know kind of qualitative or interpretive inquiry that you should include to help make sure that your method is transparent. I think we can all agree that making your method transparent is key. The challenge is in qualitative inquiry to do that, you need a lot more space, or at least some more space. And increasingly, especially like in medical journals, the space requirements are so tight. When I evaluate those, I don't know what to say sometimes because uh, when I'm reviewing, the methodological detail is not adequate. But if they only allow um, you know, um, 10, 15 pages, there's no way they can put that in there. Now there's appendices that you might be able to. But anyway, that's a, a problem. Well, and the opportunity through open access journals, I used to be very skeptical about open access journals, but I've become quite the fan of them and the methods of psychology is open access. You can have um, supplemental materials, the, the word limits are much more expansive. And so for instance, in supplemental material, you can actually have um, some of your data to support your conclusions. We've gotten some great questions in the chat. We're not gonna have time for all of them, but and I think we've covered a number of them, but I wanted to make sure we had time for some. Um, do you have any advice for faculty who are navigating uh, in department politics around this issue regarding qualitative versus quantitative approaches? I'm sorry to hear it's still a problem. <laughs> <laughs> You would think it wouldn't be a problem anymore, but I guess by that question, it's still a problem. I mean, it is still a problem, I think. And, you know, um, I think that you want to be brushed up in arguments and explanations for why you're doing what you're doing. You, you need to be able to support your approach. So to offer an account and to offer it in an accessible manner. You know, I think plugging into SQIP, uh, the Society for Qualitative Inquiry, Qualitative Inquiry in Psychology, there's a website, there's a conference, uh, great people involved. That's one way that you could help to learn that um, in terms of, because I had to do that myself. In fact, I had to publish, I published an article once that was only in, in ex, an explanation and justification of a particular approach I was using that I never thought needed to be explained, but I heard from senior colleagues on, on the tenure track that that might be a problem. <laughs> um, 
Do you think that the pandemic uh, or any of the events in the last few years is going to change the trends that you're seeing in the movement towards or away from a diversity of methodological approaches? I'll, uh, this is strictly an opinion. Um, and I'll just jump in and say in one way, maybe, and this is just off the top of my head because it's something I've been thinking about. Um, with the with the rise of Zoom and YouTube, and I know we think that's hardly, you know, a top tier journal, right? But I've been working with an article that was published like a month ago, and it had cutting edge mixed methods. In less than a month, it had 800 reads. Well, I can tell you that many longer journal articles that I spent months and months on did not get 800 reads. So I am inclined to think, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I am saying you know, people want the, you know, the YouTube videos, they get watched hundreds and hundreds of times, and people invest hundreds and hundreds of hours on articles and they get less attention than a YouTube video about the article. So maybe, mm. so it, I'm not gonna dismiss the idea, um, certainly conferences on Zoom. I mean, certainly people have found that virtual conferences are great. Um, they have pluses. What do the two of you quickly. think? Huh? I would quickly add that I think the main driver of diversity in methodology and psychology is going to be diversification, ethnically, racially, uh, gender, sexual minority, all of those kinds of diverse social identities that are increasingly coming into the field. That's what's going to drive the shift. In the, in the faculty, you're talking about in, 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 in the, the legitimacy of qualitative inquiry and psychology as a field in expanding. And that's because people who hail from our communities um, want to ask questions and need to ask questions that require those methods to answer. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a professional society or <clears throat> or a listserv that people could join? I, I obviously would think first of Squib. And so to Mitch's question about like how do you how do you get advice? How do you get consultation? How do you make your case? I wonder. I wonder first about about a listserv. The other, and I'm. I genuinely didn't think to do this piece of homework, but but what do the Wikipedia articles look like on these methods? Are they any good? I've I haven't looked. Doubt it. If if but, if, but, the, if but. they could be better. Please, please let HCAPs know. Like, we would love to work with people that actually have expertise. Um, the the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy is talking with HCAPs about the Cognitive Behavioral Therapy page on Wikipedia because it gets two million views a year, and and they're like, it could wow. be better. Um, so so that, but 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 the like Squip. I feel shameless, like you should consider joining Squip, but the, <laughs> but but that would be a great one. Um, are there other ones that you guys know about? Um, Let me suggest too that um, it's not a listserv, but the publisher, Say, Sage, is the biggest publisher about research methods. That's, I don't know about psychology, but it's the biggest publisher um, about research methods. They have enormous online resources. Um, available for training about methodology. So that's another difference that I think people aren't only relying on the classroom for their training and research methods, that a lot of that training is occurring above and beyond the classroom. And we will be posting sage, some- Remember the greenies, the SAGE methodology monographs. That's right. <laughs> oh. I thought they were blue. <laughs> and we will be posting some recommended readings and resources along with the recording of this Essential Science Conversation on the APA webpage. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all so much for your participation Hi. on this panel and for talking about a topic that sometimes is only talked about in whispers. So I'm glad that we're talking about it openly and boldly and helping to educate people about 
the changing science that we are a part of and the different ways to think about how it is that we're seeking the truth, which is what we're all trying to do. Um, thank you so much to everybody also who joined. Thanks again to Peggy and Wes for your help in coordinating these. And I really appreciate your time. Enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all. Thank you for putting this together. Yes, it was fun. Thanks, everybody. Right. I'll end the broadcast now. Bye-bye.